Welcome to the Tim Booker channel, where wisdom is worth sharing. Wishing you an enjoyable audiobook experience. Today, I'm going to decode a book for you called Psychology de la Paire, with the subtitle, Craintes, and Goyce's e Phobies. This book delves into an emotion that every one of us must face, fear. Everyone experiences fear at some point, whether it's when speaking in public, during takeoff and landing on an airplane, or even when unexpectedly discovering a small spider in the kitchen. However, we often feel ashamed of our fear and tend to avoid the things that frighten us, as well as the emotion itself, striving to appear fearless. But as the author points out, fear is actually a fundamental, universal, unavoidable, and essential emotion. It's like an alarm system that allowed our ancestors to survive in the perilous primeval jungle. In a way, fear is part of our human heritage, and it helps us increase our chances of survival. However, just like an alarm system can malfunction, if we cannot regulate our fear, we may develop phobias. Data shows that nearly half of adults experience excessive fears, and approximately one in four of those affected by excessive fear suffers from phobias. If fear is an emotion seldom discussed, today we will explore it thoroughly and scientifically. Why do we feel fear? Why do some people's fears escalate into phobias? How can we overcome fear? Psychology de la Paire is a popular science book about fear and phobias that provides answers to these questions. The author of this book is Christophe André, a renowned French psychologist, psychiatrist, best-selling author, and a leading figure in cognitive behavioral therapy in France. He has authored several best-selling books in his home country before this one. With over two decades of experience in treating phobias, he has accompanied many phobia patients to the places they fear and helped them overcome their obstacles. In this book, he condenses his understanding of phobias. With the author's expertise, we can gain a scientific understanding of fear. The next time we face those things that terrify us, perhaps we won't feel so powerless. I will break down this book into three parts for you. First, we'll discuss what phobias are and why people develop them. Next, we'll explore the different types of phobias, with a particular focus on social phobia, which has been a hot topic in recent years. Finally, we'll delve into how to conquer our inner fears. Alright, let's officially dive into this book now. When it comes to fear, each of us has some fears to varying degrees. For example, fear of darkness, fear of heights, fear of water, fear of snakes, fear of thunder, and so on. Like other animals, humans, under the influence of nature and continuous evolution, develop fears towards certain things. We need this emotion called fear, it helps us stay alert in the face of danger, avoid hazards, and increase our chances of survival. The things that commonly make us afraid are ingrained in our collective human subconscious. So even today, despite safety railings on heights and snakes being kept in cages, we still feel afraid. However, one of the reasons for the success of human evolution is our ability to modulate emotions like fear. In our brains, an ancient part known as the limbic system, or the emotional brain, is responsible for processing fear emotions. Fear arises involuntarily, beyond our control. In other words, we can't stop the emergence of fear emotions. However, we can regulate this emotion. During the process of evolution, a new structure appeared in our brains, covering the old limbic system. This new structure is called the neocortex. The neocortex enables us to decode and regulate our emotions. When we're startled, we don't freeze in place or flee immediately, instead, we experience a fear reflex and take shelter. After the danger has passed, we can return to the scene to understand what happened. The author believes that nature chose a gradual evolutionary pattern for us. Instead of replacing the limbic system directly with the neocortex, it preserved our emotional brain intact. This is a trace of human survival and evolution. On one hand, we involuntarily experience fear and exhibit reflexive behaviors. On the other hand, the neocortex allows us to regulate fear emotions. Our fear response is the result of the interaction between the limbic system and the neocortex. Experiencing fear benefits our survival, while regulating fear emotions enables us to live normal lives. Every one of us experiences fear emotions. Although we can't control the appearance of fear, we can regulate it. Most people can regulate fear well, and when the danger disappears, so does the fear. However, some individuals have an abnormal regulation function. 
Their fear emotions evolve into pathological fear, becoming a condition known as phobia. Normal fear falls within the emotional realm. It is triggered by objective dangerous situations, has limited intensity, is generally controllable, and has only a mild impact on life. Moreover, after repeated exposure to the source of fear, its intensity decreases. Phobias, on the other hand, belong to the realm of disorders. They can be triggered even in the absence of objective danger, and their intensity can lead to panic attacks. Patients with phobias exhibit severe avoidance behaviors, greatly affecting their daily lives. Even after repeated exposure, the intensity of their fear does not diminish. The things phobia patients fear may seem incomprehensible or exaggerated to those without phobias. However, through extensive research, the author has found that phobia patients perceive the world differently from those without phobias. They experience some perceptual distortions. For example, when approaching certain animals, animal phobia patients may see the animals running towards them, even feeling that the animals are already on them. The level of sensory activation in their brains is entirely different from that of individuals without phobias. Even if a dog is leashed and logically poses no threat, their amygdala reacts much faster than their rational brain. Before their rational brain catches up, their amygdala has already sounded the alarm. So why do people develop phobias? The author believes that phobias result from the dual influence of physiological and environmental factors. Physiological factors are innate, including familial and species genetics. Species genetics refer to the fear of certain things ingrained in the collective human subconscious. Environmental factors are personal life experiences. The impact of these two factors varies in different phobias. For instance, fear of water, animals, and heights is more influenced by genetic factors, while driving phobia resulting from a traumatic car accident is more influenced by environmental factors. In most cases, phobias are the result of the interaction between these two factors, and genes don't determine everything. For instance, a sensitive child may follow vastly different developmental trajectories in different life environments. Improper education and an environment that doesn't provide a sense of security can exacerbate a child's fears. However, a safe environment and education that helps the child regulate emotions can mitigate their sensitivity. Children can be afraid of many things, such as darkness, strangers, or being separated from their parents. On one hand, these fears keep people away from danger during their vulnerable childhood. On the other hand, as they grow older, some childhood fears can develop into excessive fears or even phobias. In fact, 23% of childhood fears are linked to underlying anxiety disorders and require early intervention. Many adult phobias are related to certain childhood experiences. The term, childhood trauma, to some extent encapsulates this phenomenon. However, parents often underestimate their children's fears, assuming that these fears will naturally fade with age without early intervention. As a result, as children grow up, they may lack the ability to confront their fears and become more susceptible to phobias than other children. Now, let's delve into the mechanisms of phobias, specifically, the characteristics of phobias. The mechanism of phobias consists of three components, behavioral mechanisms, psychological mechanisms, and physiological mechanisms. Let's start with behavioral mechanisms. The core of phobias is avoidance behavior. This avoidance includes avoiding certain situations, such as avoiding speaking in public, avoiding airplane journeys, and even avoiding certain images, words, or thoughts. However, numerous studies have shown that deliberately avoiding certain thoughts only increases anxiety. This is the paradox of phobic thoughts, the more you try not to think about them, the more you end up focusing on them. For individuals with phobias, they may unconsciously mold this avoidance into their way of life. For instance, they might say, I don't like socializing with people, rather than admitting, I'm afraid of socializing. They might express, I dislike outdoor activities, rather than confessing, I'm afraid of insects. Avoidance behaviors may seem effective, especially for highly anxious patients, as mild avoidance can have some initial impact. However, this is merely a short-term solution and cannot help them overcome their fear emotions. On one hand, when they encounter the feared objects or situations again, they still experience fear. On the other hand, some things are difficult to avoid permanently, such as social interactions, which we will focus on shortly. Therefore, they eventually need to cease avoidance behaviors and confront their fears, which is a key aspect of treating phobias. 
The psychological mechanism of phobias can be summarized in one sentence, fear has big eyes. For instance, a person with social phobia who receives an invitation to a social gathering begins to worry weeks in advance. During the event, they carefully scrutinize every person's face, as if using a magnifying glass to search for tiny negative expressions. They fear expressing their own opinions and worry about being ridiculed by others. Phobia sufferers concentrate their attention on their fear in a pathological manner. They aren't observing their surroundings but rather monitoring them. They continuously imagine the worst-case scenarios, immersing themselves completely in fear. In these bleak imaginings, phobia sufferers find it challenging to control their panic emotions. This is related to the physiological mechanism of fear. In our brains, there's an area known as the amygdala. When our sensory systems detect information related to fear, the amygdala gets activated and issues a fear alert. For example, when a phobia sufferer spots something resembling a snake, their amygdala immediately sounds the fear alarm, saying, attention, suspicious object, and they freeze in place. Subsequently, the alarm is transmitted to other brain structures surrounding the amygdala, primarily the hippocampus and parts of the prefrontal cortex. The hippocampus's main role is to compare past experiences. Did I encounter a situation like this before? How did I handle it then? Meanwhile, the prefrontal cortex consolidates all sensory and emotional information, formulates an action plan, and issues commands. However, for phobia sufferers, the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex may not be able to stop the alarm signals issued by the amygdala. Consequently, fear becomes unrestricted, potentially leading to panic attacks. For instance, when we're nervous or afraid, we may have the sensation that our brain goes blank. Research indicates that this statement isn't just a figurative expression. Brain imaging reveals that in people without phobias, speaking in public in a crowded place leads to a rapid increase in blood flow to their amygdala due to anxiety. However, at the same time, oxygen consumption in various cortical regions of their brain significantly increases because these areas gather various knowledge resources to cope with the current situation. In contrast, individuals with phobias exhibit intense activation of the amygdala but do not experience a significant increase in blood flow in cortical regions. This is akin to the feeling of, my brain is going blank, as they struggle to produce any response. The amygdala sends strong alarm signals, confusing the cortical regions, resulting in a blank state of mind. Having understood the mechanisms of phobias, let's discuss who is more susceptible to developing phobias. Research has shown that highly sensitive individuals are more prone to phobias. Approximately 20% of people have a lower sensory saturation threshold than the average. In other words, their senses are more easily stimulated than those of most people, making them part of the so-called highly sensitive group. Whether it's noise, smells, or interpersonal stimuli, they are more sensitive than the majority of individuals. This heightened sensitivity extends to phobias, making them more susceptible to developing these conditions. In terms of gender, females are more likely to suffer from phobias. Interestingly, research has found that the emotional stability of female infants tends to be higher than that of male infants. It's only around the age of two that this trend reverses due to external environmental influences. This shift occurs because, from this age onward, people begin to have different expectations for children of different genders. Shyness and vulnerability are considered normal for girls, while boys are expected to be brave and fearless. Beyond societal expectations related to gender, girls tend to have a stronger ability to grasp emotions and are more sensitive to their parents' fear emotions. This means that girls have a stronger capacity to learn fear. As a result of the combined influence of innate and environmental factors, there are more female phobia sufferers compared to males. Now that we've explored why people develop phobias, let's discuss the types of phobias. The book categorizes phobias into three main types, specific phobias, agoraphobia, and social phobia. Specific phobias are relatively straightforward and involve a fear of particular objects or situations, such as a fear of specific animals, water, heights, darkness, or certain natural elements. It can also include fears of specific scenarios, like fear of flying or traveling by boat. Specific phobias are common, and the avoidance behaviors of sufferers typically do not significantly impact their daily lives. Compared to other types of phobias, individuals with specific phobias are less likely to seek treatment. The second type of phobia is agoraphobia, characterized by a fear of physical discomfort. 
In 1872, a German neurologist named Westphal discovered that many patients experienced extreme fear, palpitations, trembling, and other anxiety symptoms when crossing open squares. He named this condition agoraphobia. Researchers later found that agoraphobia patients are not actually afraid of open spaces like squares, rather, they fear a sensation of discomfort. This fear can manifest anywhere but intensifies in certain public places. When this fear is mild, it can lead to symptoms like dizziness or unusual sensations. However, when the fear is extremely intense, patients may experience a feeling of impending death or mental instability, leading to panic attacks. We all occasionally have uncontrollable, peculiar thoughts in our lives. For example, when speaking in public, we might involuntarily think, what if I forget my next words, or when swimming in deep water, a thought might cross our minds, what if I get a cramp? These strange thoughts can be uncomfortable. For most people, this discomfort doesn't last long because we immediately tell ourselves not to dwell on such thoughts. However, for some individuals, these discomforting feelings may intensify and may even lead to symptoms like breathing difficulties or rapid heartbeat. They become concerned about losing control. As these sensations continue to intensify, they may result in panic attacks. Panic attacks are rapid and intense episodes of anxiety often accompanied by somatic symptoms like breathlessness, chills, dizziness, and sometimes a feeling of unreality. Patients may lose control and exhibit unusual behaviors, such as intentionally crashing into windows. When individuals start avoiding travel to prevent panic attacks, they develop agoraphobia. Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, suffered from agoraphobia. Starting at the age of 28, he frequently experienced anxiety attacks with symptoms like a racing heart and dizziness. Consequently, after concluding his global travels, he led a reclusive life. The third type of phobia is social phobia. The author considers this to be the most destructive type of phobia because it undermines a fundamental attribute of human beings as social animals. Most of us experience stage fright or shyness in social situations, and such fears are benign and quite normal. Today, we often jest about having social anxiety, which is usually of this mild nature. We can carry on with normal social interactions, and we don't find it difficult to handle the gaze of others. However, true social phobia is different, it's a severe condition. In social situations, individuals with social phobia experience extreme distress, sometimes even panic attacks. They may feel anxious, embarrassed, and depressed due to their perceived social inadequacy, severely affecting their quality of life. Some social phobia sufferers fear any form of interaction in their daily lives, and the mere gaze of others can make their social existence excruciating. Epidemiological statistics indicate that approximately 2% to 4% of people have this condition. Many individuals with social phobia also experience depression or alcohol addiction concurrently. Moreover, Diagnosing social phobia often takes a long time, with an average diagnosis duration of up to 15 years. Social phobia can manifest in various forms. Some fear situations that require self-presentation, such as job interviews or public speaking. Some fear the scrutiny of others in simple actions like walking or drinking water, they feel anxious under the gaze of others. Others fear self-expression, making it challenging for them to share their deeper thoughts and establish intimate relationships with others. Social phobia can affect individuals of different personality types. Some have avoidant personalities, characterized by excessive sensitivity to others' opinions, leading to overinterpretation of facial expressions and statements. They tend to resist participating in social activities. However, others have confrontational personalities, and they also experience fear. Nevertheless, they choose to confront social situations and protect themselves through aloof and aggressive behaviors, keeping others at a distance. Their aloofness is merely a facade, concealing profound anxiety and emotional burdens. However, different social phobia sufferers exhibit some common traits, primarily an excessive focus on the self. They tend to engage in intense self-criticism and negative introspection, often experiencing anger. Their self-focus is not rooted in narcissism but rather on closely monitoring their bodily reactions. For instance, when they start blushing, their minds incessantly ponder, will others notice that I'm blushing? How can I stop myself from blushing? After social activities, individuals with social phobia engage in negative self-examination and reflection, feeling that they performed poorly. This often leads to feelings of shame and anger, 
and they may harbor resentment towards everyone around them. All these factors significantly impact the social lives of individuals with social phobia. Beyond these three types of phobias, there are also some rare phobias. Some people have a fear of choking, they can only eat semi-liquid, small, cut-up foods, and they fear taking capsule medications or wearing high-collared clothing or neckties. Others fear vomiting in public places and avoid eating before social events, fearing they might vomit in public. Various things you might not imagine could be objects of intense fear for some individuals. Regardless of the type of phobia, it can disrupt a patient's life to some extent. Therefore, overcoming fear is a mandatory course for phobia sufferers. In fact, even for those without phobias, there are occasional moments when we fear things in life. Thus, learning to overcome fear holds significance for everyone. So, let's talk about how to defeat fear. The issue lies not in the fear itself but in the response to fear. The problem for phobia sufferers is their vulnerability when confronted with fear. The solution to fear is learning not to fear fear and gaining control over it. The treatment for phobias involves having patients face their fears directly and accepting a certain level of fear. The author proposes that currently, only two treatments have been proven effective, medication therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, has become the recommended treatment for phobias in the past decade. CBT doesn't focus on uncovering the root causes of a patient's fear or delving into their painful past but instead emphasizes symptom and situational adaptation exercises, helping patients confront their fears independently and gain self-efficacy. Key techniques include exposure therapy, cognitive restructuring, relaxation, and breath control, among others. Let's take social phobia as an example to discuss the methods of treating phobias more specifically. First, individuals with social phobia need to engage in some cognitive exercises. For social phobia patients, a crucial aspect of treating social anxiety is accepting their true selves and altering some cognitive misconceptions. Social phobia sufferers often care excessively about others' opinions and frequently misinterpret them. During social interactions, they tend to have negative thoughts about themselves, thinking they look foolish or that they've said something wrong. However, it's essential to realize that not everyone is evaluating you, and people aren't scrutinizing your every move. Social phobia patients should learn to identify and promptly stop these negative thoughts when they arise. When you recognize your fear, you should learn to analyze it and attempt to change your thought patterns, halting unrealistic anticipations. Social phobia sufferers often involuntarily envision worst-case scenarios, leading to unnecessary anxiety. For example, Someone may fear going to a dinner party, worrying that they won't be able to chat naturally with others and fearing that others will judge them strangely. In reality, they can engage in conversation and casual chatter with ease, this is merely a social ritual. Practicing such cognitive pattern transformations is crucial. Beyond cognitive exercises, overcoming social phobia also requires real-world scenario exercises. Exposure therapy is a common method, with scene exposure exercises being a classic approach. Therapists invite patients to confront the things they fear, such as having a social phobia patient deliver a public speech. Another method is internal sensation exposure, addressing the bodily sensations that social phobia patients fear, the uncomfortable feelings of anxiety. Therapists deliberately induce these sensations, like making patients walk upstairs quickly to increase heart rate or spin in a chair to induce dizziness, while guiding them to tolerate these sensations without anxiety. Exposure exercises enable patients to gradually confront their fears. This therapy follows some principles. Exposure duration should be long, typically exceeding 45 minutes. Exposure should be comprehensive, avoiding even slight avoidance behaviors if possible, and it should be repeated. Suspected exposure exercises are insufficient. Repetition is essential to gradually rewire the brain to convince the emotional brain that danger does not exist. Most importantly, exposure exercises must be gradual. For example, for someone with acrophobia, fear of heights, they can start by standing on a chair, then moving to a table, then to a balcony, a bridge, and so on. For individuals with social phobia, they can list 10 situations that trigger fear and rank them by anxiety level, gradually confronting all the situations that induce anxiety, starting with small goals. The first goal might be asking strangers for directions on the street, and the second might be entering a store and engaging in conversation with a salesperson. Start small, take it slow, and do one thing at a time. 
Through exposure exercises, patients can improve their avoidance behaviors, realizing that the situations they once avoided weren't as significant as they believed. Additionally, patients learn not to have panic attacks due to fear and shame emotions. Instead of avoiding, it's better to learn to adapt to fear. When you no longer retreat, it's fear that begins to recede. The author mentioned that towards the end of his psychotherapy sessions with patients, he asks them what has helped them the most. The patient's answers are consistent, it's when you force me to confront my fears. We've just discussed the treatment of social phobia as an example, explaining how exposure exercises and cognitive exercises are used to treat social phobia. Besides, the author provides more practice exercises and methods in the book. If you're interested, you can explore more content in the book. Here, we've unraveled the essence of this book, so let's summarize. Every one of us experiences fear, which is a fundamental and essential emotion. It helped our human ancestors survive in the perilous jungles of ancient times and has left many fears embedded in our collective subconscious. We cannot avoid fear, but we can manage it. When this regulation malfunctions, however, it can lead to phobias. The core characteristic of phobias is the avoidance of things that trigger fear and an excessive preoccupation with one's own fear. Highly sensitive individuals are more prone to developing phobias, and there are more female phobia sufferers compared to males. We've explored the three types of phobias, with social phobia being a topic of particular concern. Most people casually joke about being socially anxious, but for true phobia sufferers, social situations can be extremely distressing, even leading to panic attacks, shame, depression, and other extreme emotions, significantly impacting their lives. Currently, we have treatments like medication and cognitive behavioral therapy to address social phobia and other phobias. In a similar vein to the Stoic philosophy prayer, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, the battle against fear aligns with this sentiment. We can't eliminate fear entirely, but we need the wisdom to recognize our emotions, the strength to endure instinctive fear, and the courage to confront it. We don't need to be fearless individuals, but we should strive to be courageous and wise enough to overcome fear. That wraps up the core content of this book. Congratulations on completing another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share with your family and friends. Wisdom is worth spreading, opening the door to a brighter future. Thank you, and goodbye.